you know, this is a very ambitious project. And obviously, you know, being who I am and being who you are, we can't really escape the the other reason that this is historic. Uh, being a person of color, an African-American who's going to be a part of this historic mission and go farther than any Black man's ever gone before or woman. Talk about that, because I know this is very important to you. You know, we have the first uh, person of color, the first Black man, we have the first woman, we have the first non-American, a Canadian space agency astronaut. I just think it's important for us to live up to, to the words in some of our foundational documents, you know, of the people, by the people. So we're, we're exploring for all people, and now we can say we're exploring with or by all people. And, and, and while there's a lot of energy focusing on us, each of us that are doing something first, uh, I was the first African-American, the first black astronaut to live on the International Space Station. But I'm really happy that uh, the second went right up after me, Jessica Watkins, and she's back safely now. And we're about to send another one, uh, actually a couple more. And so it's it, really what's most important. Uh, the exciting part about being a first is that there is a, a prospect of there being a second, a third and a fourth and it actually becoming normal. I really look forward to the point where it's not remarkable that a black man is exploring the solar system or, or running uh, this country. And so I'm excited to be a part of that, but I'm really excited just that it's happening because this moment right now is enabled by decisions that our leaders made years ago, decades ago, that our astronaut corps is going to represent our country. I'm not sure if many people know, but Nichelle Nichols, Lieutenant Uhura from Star Trek, you know, there's a story that she was considering leaving the show, but Martin Luther King convinced her to stay because of what she represented and who she represented. She became one of the biggest advocates for racial and gender diversity in NASA, and she recruited for NASA and is responsible for the diversity that we saw in the late 70s and early 80s in our human space exploration programs. Well, let's go back to that era, because at the very same time that that was happening, of course, you had the Black Civil Rights Movement, you had the Black Power Movement, you had these struggles for racial equality and justice yes. here on Earth, here in California. Yes. Um, I know that the, the poem by Gil Scott Heron is important to you, Whitey on the Moon. This is not exactly a love letter to the space race. Can you talk about yeah. why that, that poem resonates for you? Yeah. So first of all, I want to put this in context. You know, I use this uh, this this song as sort of the, the 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 lead song, the vanguard of the idea that not only do I go out and try to do education and outreach to the public, I also do that inside of NASA. And so one of my first speeches uh, was to my colleagues to tell them, hey, remember who you're talking to. Don't forget about us. Like little me when I was a kid didn't feel connected to this. And so just to help them broaden their understanding of what America is. And that's why that song, it represents that for me. And, and the fact that everybody isn't in love with what we're doing, most a lot of people are, and that's encouraging. Uh, but also, there are people who are concerned about their communities and their roads and their health care and their education and their parks and green space. And that makes sense. I have kids and I want my kids to have their the best of everything. But so so I understand those concerns. And so to put this in context, you know, when I encourage my colleagues to listen to that poem and many of them already had, but but several of them had never heard it. And so just to understand that in 1968, when we think of that time as just, oh, everybody was encouraged about moonshots. No, there were people protesting racial discrimination, jobs, health care, uh, and labor. There were people that were protesting the war, and those were much bigger things looming in their lives. They were impacted by that. And we, we need to understand that perspective. It's not just about answering with what NASA brings to the world. That's there. But a part of it is just considering it, just taking time to understand and empathize. And, and here's the other part I wanted to bring up is that that song is representative of a long list. I share with people, one, read the Constitution of the United States. Uh, and I like to highlight Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3, you know, the part that talks about, you know, all people are counted for purposes of taxation and representation, but everybody else uh, is considered three-fifths of a person. Remember, that's still in there. Uh, I encourage them to read The Letter from Birmingham Jail by Martin Luther King, uh, the, paranoid style of, the paranoid, paranoid Style of American Politics uh, by Richard Hofstetter. Um, there, there's a bunch of things. And then there's movies and music, The 13th, uh, the movie about the 13th Amendment by uh, Ava DuVernay, 
the song um, Shoes by Lupe Fiasco. That's about Ahmaud Arbery, who was murdered because he was out jogging, getting some exercise, something I do three times a week. And I think about him every time I'm out running. Um, I am not your Negro about James Baldwin. I mean, I could go on. There's so much. In, in, and during the pandemic, when people were stuck at home facing physical and economic security, no matter what you look like, for the first time in, in a long time, everybody was experiencing similar physical and economic insecurity. Uh, and then when the George Floyd news and Ahmaud Arbery news made everybody think about racial injustice, people were asking me, what, what can I do? Well, I just happened to have been compiling this list my whole life. And my parents were, you know, compiled these lists their whole lives. And so I share it with my colleagues at NASA to help us have a healthier perspective on what we are doing for the country. And when we say that we can do big things when we work together, not in spite of our differences, but because of the power of our differences, that I want them to really understand the power of that statement. When we work together, we can do big things. Talk about perspective. You know, you're going to take all of that social consciousness, all the things that you are, that we are as African Americans to outer space, to space, you know, and hopefully to, to Mars. I don't know, you know, when that, <laughs> when that, you'll see that horizon. But when you take this historic trip, uh, which is slated for 2024, 20, the first part of this mission anyway, given everything you just said, what do you think you're going to see when you look back at the earth from that incredible vantage point as a black man with everything you just told me? Wow. It, it's hard to say, you know, because seeing the, the earth from 250 miles up blew me away. I've seen pictures, I've studied it, thought about it, but it still was hard to say what that would be like until I saw it. It really, I have no words to really adequately describe it. So I can only imagine looking through the moon with the moon in the foreground close to us to then see the earth, the entire earth. From the space station, you can only see a part of it. From, from the moon, we'll be able to see all of it, everything. You know, Gandhi is down there, Martin Luther King, uh, and so is Adolf Hitler. Like, they're all down there. And I tell you, earth is beautiful. It's, it, it's terrific and terrible in some ways, and for some people. It's complicated, but it is everything we know and love, and it's home. And I, I don't know. So with that kind of as the context, I, I can't wait to see it from that perspective and then share and talk about what that moment meant. But I don't know. I'm going to let it surprise me um, because, you know, space has a lot to teach us about ourselves. And you have to quiet down your mind and your internal biases and what you think you know to let Earth whisper in your ear and in your heart. And so I'm going to try hard to do that and let Earth and space teach me. And one last question. I know you've got a, a great family. Um, you have some wonderful daughters. <laughs> what are you telling them about this trip? Are they afraid for you? Are they, they must be proud of you, of course, but. <laughs> yeah, you know, every space mission comes with risk and we do our best to learn the hardware and the software. But at the end of the day, every space mission is about trust. And I work hard with NASA to build confidence in the team. We learn the systems, but the system also has to learn us. But uh, in terms of preparing my family to go on these missions, my wife and I talked about it before our first mission. And we say, hey, it's our responsibility to get this family ready for this journey as well. And I will tell you, that was one of my favorite aspects of my last mission. And I'm looking forward to that for this one. But it's also, you know, my last mission was 168 days away from Earth and my family. This one's going to be 10 days. So that alone, they were excited about that. And so, yes, we're going a lot farther. It has different risks. Uh, but they know that their dad is going to be out there doing his best. My crewmates are going to be doing their best to, to get back to them safely, first and foremost, but also to do what we can for, for Earth and for humanity. Awesome. Well, I know there's going to be a lot of folks here in California rooting for you. You're, you're native of uh, Southern California, Pomona. Uh, shout yes, out sir. to them. Thank you so much for your time, Navy captain and NASA astronaut <laughs> and uh, Probably the first uh, black man to head to the moon. Uh, if all goes as planned next year. Yes. Robert Jr. Thank you. Thank you.